Thank you for joining us for day two of the Integration Symposium here at Fuller Theological Seminary, brought to you by the School of Psychology and Marriage Family Therapy. Well, thank you. And once again, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be with you. You know, it would be so nice if we were together in person uh, or not. We are together, but not in person. So uh, occasionally I get asked uh, to preach in churches, uh, which, by the way, is an activity that I am uniquely unqualified for. OK, uh, but uh, have, having never, uh, you know, attended seminary or uh, taken a course in homiletics, uh, but as long as they let me preach, you know, the, the good news of gratitude, uh, it's all good. Uh, I'm OK. So that's what I always, you know, attempt to do. And I suspect that's why I get asked anyway uh, to come to uh, churches and, and to do that. Well, I, I've listened to enough sermons, though over the years to know that one should always begin with scripture, right? You got to start with scripture and go from there. So that's what I'm going to do today. Today, we're going to talk about <clears throat> gratitude to God and uh, talk a little bit about identity, uh, the spirit of gratitude. Uh, yesterday, I introduced you to the science of gratitude, what gratitude is and <clears throat> how it works and why it matters, the difference that it makes. We're going to continue along those lines, but move more into talking about the, the spirituality of gratitude. What do religious traditions and faith traditions have to say about it? How is it approached uh, differently from a spiritual point of view as opposed to a more, you know, scientific or psychological or empirical point of view? Uh, but anyway, I do want to begin with a, a scripture, and I find it sometimes useful to uh, to preach from. I don't. Even want, I shouldn't even say I preach from because I'm not a preacher. I speak from. Uh, the very famous account, uh, Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19, uh, the familiar parable where Jesus heals the 10 lepers, okay, which I always found fascinating, uh, this parable as a, as a child, you know, growing up uh, in a Christian family, attending Christian schools, uh, going to Christian churches, uh, eating Christian foods, wearing Christian clothes, and all of those things. Uh, this, this parable always fascinated me. I guess maybe because um, it's just so shocking that, you know, 90% of those who received a tremendous gift from Jesus were ungrateful, and only one was. Uh, I think it was more than that, though. I think it was just because it was about leprosy, which I found so fat as a child, you know, uh, attending a Catholic school, the way that the nuns uh, describe leprosy. It was always so, in such graphic uh, terms, uh, I found that interesting as well. Anyway, uh, you're all familiar with this, I suspect, right? So uh, we know that uh, Jesus heals, right? They, they're asked to... Uh, have mercy on us, you know, Lord. And he says, go show yourselves to the priests who were, you know, the public health officials. They had to declare the lepers clean so they could return back into uh, society. And so he does, in fact, heal them of their physical disease and of their social stigma, pronounced clean of their contagious condition, no longer social outcasts. They get their old lives back, right? They get to go back to their communities. They go back to their families for the first time in years. You know, they can uh, hug their children and kiss their wives, and uh, they're no longer social outcasts, get their lives back. And basically, they, they're brought back to life. I mean, Jesus does a ton for them, right? And so you would think they would be tremendously grateful, right? Um, what was their response, right? Only one returns to give thanks. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice, threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, so where's everyone else, basically? You know, where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Well, uh, growing up, again, <clears throat> the way I was always taught this parable and the meaning of it, the interpretation was it was, uh, isn't it uh, great that uh, one person came back? You should be like that one person, right? Don't be like the other nine. Don't be an ingrate. 
but be grateful, right? Model yourself after the one individual, okay? Uh, and that was kind of surprising, but uh, I heard a sermon a few years ago, which really just changed the way I thought about this parable and kind of changed the way I thought about gratitude and giving and gifts and grace uh, and all of those things. And uh, the interpretation I heard, which is what I try to share with people when I, uh, I preach on this, again, teach from it or talk about uh, this parable, is that what was most surprising was not that one was grateful or that nine was not. What was surprising was that Jesus heals all 10, knowing full well that only one was going to come back and be grateful. So Jesus's gift of healing was not based on expected gratitude, right? Uh, while it's the case that, you know, grace will, will mobilize gratitude, okay, that is a person who receives a free gift will in fact be grateful if they recognize it as such. Uh, gratitude does not mobilize grace or expected gratitude does not mobilize grace, right? So Jesus gives, even though we knowing that no one's going to come back or very few, 10%, are going to be grateful. So I think this is super important, and it, it, it um, led me to think about ways in which gratitude in a divine context is different than gratitude in a person-to-person -person or human-to-human -human context, the difference between divine giving and human giving. Uh, after all, we give, uh, I think, largely because we expect to be thanked, right? And what happens when we give and give and give and we don't get thanked, the person just ignores us or, you know, never writes that thank you card or shows no signs of gratitude. Eventually, you know, the gifts dry up, you know, we move on and say, hey, that's an ingrate. Uh, you know, why, why should I bother to continue to show gifts, give gifts and show grace and compassion and so forth. But divine giving, very different from our own giving. So one way in which I think gratitude to God or in a divine context is different from human gratitude. Well, I start with that just to uh, say today I want to talk more about gratitude in a spiritual context or in a context of uh, theological uh, knowing or awareness. Okay. I like to think about gratitude as a spiritual concept, right? Um, yesterday we talked about it as a psychological concept or construct, you know, as, as a way of seeing, a way of looking at life. Uh, as an emotion, as an attitude, uh, as a form of coping. Uh, today, we're going to talk about it as a virtue. Uh, I know Pam is going to uh, share with us her thoughts about gratitude as a virtue. I think of it as all of those things and more. It really does direct our minds to the vast oceans of reality that are invisible. When you think about gratitude, I think gratitude is a spiritual quest. You know, it's a search for origins. I mean, what is the search for origins if it's not religious, right? We're searching for the origins of, of ourselves, of our identity, of goodness in the world, the good that we receive from others, of benevolence, of kindness, of compassion. It's a profoundly spiritual quest, okay? And so the need to understand origins is a spiritual quest. Gratitude, I believe, directs our minds to the vast oceans of reality that are not visible. When we're grateful for something, we, consi we consider, where does it come from, right? Who gave it to us? Why did this come about? Uh, what would my life be like if I did not have this in my life or this person or this gift or this goodness, right? So we, we profoundly reflect on these things. We affirm the good, as I mentioned yesterday, and then we recognize the sources of this good. I think that these are, you know, profoundly spiritual questions. In addition to others, we could ask like, you know, now having received this good, how should I respond, right? What do I do with this good? How do I treat this good in accordance with the intentions of the giver and all of those things? Uh, so we know that the, the, the texts, the teachings, the traditions, the sayings, the scriptures, the sacraments of all the relig religious traditions um, privilege gratitude, gratitude to God, gratitude to each other. These are all very important worldviews that tell us that there's something very fundamental about human beings when it comes to thankfulness, gratefulness, as I mentioned yesterday, the deepest touch point of uh, human life. Well, some of you, and I mentioned this briefly in passing yesterday, some of you may be aware of or familiar with uh, a major research initiative that was sponsored by the John Templin Foundation on the very topic of gratitude to God. Uh, again, it, it occurred to me some years ago, and I had been involved in other 
initiatives and uh, wrote uh, successful grants to help get people to sponsor their research on gratitude in a relational sense, interpersonal sense, developmental psychology, social psychology, gratitude in medicine, gratitude in healthcare, gratitude in educational settings, and, and so on. Uh, but it occurred to me that virtually none of the research that had been published on the science of gratitude looked explicitly and specifically of, about gratitude in a spiritual context, especially gratitude to God. So with some encouragement and some um, uh, support from, well, a lot of support, and a lot of encouragement from the Templin Foundation, we were able to uh, obtain a grant as a project that is uh, jointly with uh, Biola University and the University of California, Davis, uh, that's designed to examine just ways in which gratitude to God differ from person-to-person -person gratitude. A drawing upon theology and philosophy and religious studies and people and, and uh, researchers and scholars from various uh, traditions. So one of the reasons why I love to study gratitude is that it is so complex. There are so many layers and levels to it. It does require examination from a number of different viewpoints. Uh, both involving the sciences as well as the humanities. And so that's what this initiative is all about. And I'm not going to go into that, into the, the individual projects. But if you're interested, just go to the Gratitude to God website. It's gratitudetogod.com. And you can read descriptions of the, the projects. There's something like 26 projects, uh, both uh, early career, uh, younger people with uh, brand new PhDs or some about to get their PhDs, postdocs as well as older, uh, more senior experienced individuals uh, examining various ways in which gratitude to God is played out uh, in people's lives and what it all means and, and uh, all those sorts of things. Well, let me give you just a couple of quotes uh, that may be familiar to you. I'm gonna throw a lot of names at people today and this is kind of how I do integration. Uh, you know, I know integration means a lot of different things to different people. And I mentioned yesterday when I first began my forays into gratitude, I would just try to, you know, devour everything I could that had been written about gratitude. Well, that soon became very overwhelming because there's a lot, uh, you know, psychologists, relative latecomers to the study of gratitude, but it's been around as a concept in philosophical, religious thought and spiritual and philosophical writings for many, many centuries, in fact. Um, but it's really at the heart of faith, especially the Christian faith. Although, again, uh, one can find cases and examples of it and, and encouragements and scriptures and uh, practices and rituals and litanies and all the major faith traditions. It was John Wesley who said that true religion is right tempers towards God and man. It is, in two words, benevolence and gratitude. Gratitude to our creator and supreme benefactor and benevolence to our fellow creatures. I thought, oh, that's beautiful. Right, I mean, that's the, that cuts right to the heart of it, right there, right? Two things, right? Benevolence, gratitude, and then it's, you know, it's ben benevolence, which issues out of gratitude. When one is grateful, one, one wants to give back the good they've received. Uh, in fact, you can think of gratitude that way as giving away the goodness or giving back uh, the goodness. So, so I like that. Uh, what else do I have for you today? Let's see, let me give you a definition of gratitude, a little bit different than what I gave you yesterday when I said, hey, remember, uh, there's two things. There's affirmation and there's recognition, true enough. But this is a definition that comes from uh, someone whose thought I admire very, very much. This is Charles Matthews. Chuck Matthews is a professor of religious studies at the University of Virginia, and he's involved in the Gratitude to God initiative. And he defines gratitude this way. Now, again, he's taking a, a perspective from uh, the uh, study of religions or humanities as opposed to empirical sciences. And he says that gratitude is a loosely coherent spectrum of responsive attitudes manifest by humans in their dealings with one another and the cosmos. A response more than a preemptive attitude. Gratitude is one of the more durable features of human existence. So uh, you know, what he says uh, is that, look, you know, we can study gratitude a lot of different ways. Gratitude has been, has been the serious uh, object of serious study of traditions for centuries, right? Uh, in distinctly philosophical, theological ways. Now, psychologists come along and say, okay, here's how we're going to study this and measure it and define it and see what its effects are in people's lives and 
all those things that I shared with you uh, yesterday. But I am fully aware. I'm in full agreement with uh, Matthews that you know psychologists don't have monopoly uh, on the truth when it comes to understanding gratitude. That in fact it does require insights and perspectives and examination from a number of different vantage points, especially those in theological perspectives and philosophical thought as well. Listen to this. This is what, what Chuck writes. He says, many scholars who study gratitude recognize that thin conceptions of gratitude, by thin, he mean you know, solely empirical uh, examinations, like I talked about yesterday, like having people write a gratitude journal, developing a questionnaire to measure gratitude. That's good. That's fine. But sometimes maybe we need to add a little bit more, a few more layers uh, to be able to give some texture and color to our notions of gratitude and gratefulness and thankfulness. These thin conceptions only imperfectly capture the more ancient traditions of religious and philosophical inquiry and of, often miss their most important insights. These traditions typically attend to gratitude not only in terms of our sociality, but also as reflecting our participation in a world or, uh, yeah, in a world normatively experienced, speaking to realities and relationships that more narrowly empirical approaches can have a hard time incorporating. These realities include the fundamental structures, forces, and agencies that undergird the normal intelligibility of the cosmos and the possibility, perhaps, the necessity that humans must somehow relate to them. Serious attention to these traditions then could not enormously enrich these recent inquiries. Right? So he's saying, look, the psychology, we need that. We, we need the sciences. Okay, We've made a lot of progress in understanding what gratitude is and how to get more of it, why it matters, and how it works. But we also need the insights from these more ancient traditions, which can add a lot of layers and textures and um, deepening and broadening our understanding of gratitude. Because as I mentioned yesterday, uh, it occurs, it appears in all of these traditions uh, and has from the beginning of time in the scriptures, in the teachings, the text traditions, and so on. Well, theologians have a lot to say, and there's a lot to contribute, and they have become very vocal in uh, adding to the adding to the rich texture of our understanding and the scholarship of gratitude, as has philosophers, especially from the field of moral uh, philosophy. I mentioned yesterday that uh, you know my my goal has been to explore the ways in which gratitude is a really deep touch point of human existence. And I said that lots of great things have been said about gratitude down through the ages, especially by philosophers who said it's the greatest of the virtues or the queen of the virtues. It's a parent of the virtues. They say it's the secret to life, the key that opens all doors, a virtue as vast as life itself. Now that's only half the picture, okay? Because if you actually look at what people have said about ingratitude, even more powerful statements have been made about ingratitude as a vice. If if um, gratitude is the queen of the virtues, it would seem that ingratitude can qualify as king of the vices. Ingratitude is, in fact, is an accusation. It's nice if people say you're grateful or you think of yourself as a grateful person. You know, that's all well and good. But one thing you don't want to have people say about you is that you're an ingrate, that you're an ungrateful individual. So ingratitude is actually an, an accusation, right? The essence of vileness. I think that was Immanuel Kant who said that. Uh, David Hume said it was a most horrible and unnatural crime, a malignancy of the soul, monstrous and hideous, one person said about ingratitude. Uh, how about Jonathan Edwards? Throw out one other uh, famous uh, name from centuries ago. Had quite a bit to say about gratitude, especially supernatural gratitude. And he made that famous distinction between natural gratitude and supernatural gratitude, gratitude to God for the benefits that God provides, but there's also gratitude just for the nature of who God is. Uh, but this is what he said about ingratitude. Call me ungrateful and call me all that is bad. It is impossible there should be a more odious character given a man than that he is ungrateful. So uh, pretty powerful stuff, right? Um, so gratitude, virtue, and gratitude, vice, uh, whether we take a you know, theological, philosophical, or for that matter, psychological perspective, uh, each of these disciplines shows a remarkable agreement on the nature of uh, the, the concept here. Now, 
one of the things I mentioned yesterday is that gratitude involves a recognition, recognition that the sources of the good thing that we have or goodness itself comes from outside of the self. Okay, this in itself can be controversial. Uh, one could say, well, it is possible I could be grateful to myself or grateful for good things that I have. And yes, uh, at least certainly the latter part of that makes a lot of sense. And we know that people are grateful for qualities, talents, strengths, abilities that they have. This enables them to give back the good they receive. Basically what they're doing, they're giving back the goodness. They're giving away part of themselves uh, because gifts become you know, an expression and extension of ourselves. That's uncontroversial. Uh, quite a bit different to say that one thanks oneself for one's gifts. Uh, you have to do, do a little mental um, uh, trigonometry to make that work. But I do want to talk about the recognitions of gratitude, okay? What gratitude requires. I mentioned yesterday that typically there's a, there's a three-part uh, sequence here, a three-term construal, to use the words of uh, philosopher Bob Roberts, who says it always involves uh, three things, a benefactor, a benefit, and a beneficiary, right? A gift, a giver, and a receiver. So what do we recognize? Well, when we are grateful, we recognize that there's a good, there's a benefit that we have received. We have something of value, okay? Uh, we recognize there was a giver behind that, some form of external agency. So we are sensitive to the gift, we're sensitive to the giver. The essential direction of gratitude is outward. Uh, that's what I want to say. That's how I want to express that. The, the essential direction of gratitude is outward. It's self-transcendent. Okay? It, it's, it connects us to something outside of ourselves, which again, is one of the reasons why I see it as a profoundly spiritual concept. And so the search for what we're grateful for is in fact a spiritual quest. We recognize that it is undeserved or unearned or unmerited you know, think about the concept of grace. What is grace? You know, it's unmerited favor. Uh, show it to you. We're, we're undeserving, but we get a good thing, despite the fact that we may not have earned it or deserve it or expected it or merited it. Uh, we cannot claim it by right, but there it is, uh, nevertheless. Uh, fourth, and this one is, don't always have to have this element, I think, to experience gratitude. We must recognize uh, that there's intentionality on the part of the giver. Now, if we have that, we're more likely to experience gratitude. If we believe that person or our agent has intentionally provided the benefit for us, we're more likely to be grateful, right? So I'm, I'm going to say usually, but not always, because we can imagine occasions where, you know, uh, we're, we're benefited, but not in a direct personal way. We just happen to be the recipient of a good thing, which is coming our way as well as the way of other people. Nobody intended us for us specifically, but yet we feel grateful anyway. Or maybe they actually did not intend it for our benefit, but it was a side effect. You know, maybe their intention could be selfish by giving us a gift. You know, gift giving is, uh, there's all sorts of issues involved with gift giving, right? It, you know, gifts can bring, you know, pride. Gifts can bring envy. Gifts can, gifts can be humiliating sometimes if we feel we can't, you know, return it, uh, return the favor, right? If it's out of proportion. Uh, in the context of the particular relationship, right? So, so gift giving, gift exchange uh, can be very problematic. And so uh, we can't always say that someone intends the gift for our benefit because there could be other motivations uh, behind that, all right? And then lastly, and this I think is perhaps the most critical point here. Well, they're all critical, but, but the need to give back the good that we have received. What distinguishes being grateful from merely being happy? or being uh, joyful, as Rebecca Barrett mentioned yesterday in her comments, or being pleased by something. It's a positive feeling, but there's also the desire to give back in some measure to which we have received. Okay, we wanna make a return. A grateful person wants to favor others because he or she has been favored, him or herself, right? That's the distinctive mark of gratefulness, the need to give back, to make a return distinguishes gratitude from other positive feelings. And maybe one reason why it's not purely a, you know, a uh, positively valenced feeling as a, as a feeling, because it can be uh, also saturated with feelings of, you know, responsibility, obligation, indebtedness, and so on. So um, there's a, a quote that I have on my, I keep on my wall because I find it very uh, motivating and very uh, insightful by Tony Cronman. Tony Cronman is the former dean of the Yale University Law School. And this is what he says about giving back a gift or reciprocating a gift. 
He says, second only to the inability to feel gratitude, the worst disaster that can befall a human being is to be blocked in the desire to thank the world by making a reciprocating gift that is adequate to the one he or she has received. He's saying that's part and parcel, that's foundational and fundamental to gratitude, is giving back the good that we have received. Well, Kramen has said some um, interesting things, also some controversial things about gratitude, especially in a Christian context, which I will get to and share with you, uh, a quote with you in just a moment. The point of all this is just to remind us that gratitude is complicated. It's not, it's not a simple good feeling in, in response to a benefit or a goodness, but it can become complicated uh, quite easily because it can raise up issues of dependency, right? So here we are, we're dependent upon a giver. Uh, what about that? What happens if that giver has, you know, benefited us, but also harmed us in any kind of long-term relationship? There's a mixture of, you know, probably being, being harmed or being slighted uh, by the same person who has benefited us in various ways. That makes gratitude complicated, uh, especially, you know, in a, in a relational context. What about obligation? I'm obligated to give back the good. It doesn't feel quite right just to always be receiving and never to give back, right? A sense of indebtedness. There's different meanings of indebtedness. And some of the people in the Gratitude to God project are trying to tease apart what is good indebtedness or glad indebtedness. Well, we want to be indebted. It feels good. It, it connects us. Uh, in a deep and substantial and sustainable way with our giver versus a debt we want to wipe out as soon as possible, you know, like, like a car loan or home loan. You feel good uh, when you cross that debt off. Uh, but a debt of gratitude is something we may want to hold on to a little bit because it, it, it binds us to our giver. But again, remember that the gift is freely given, okay? Uh, it's unearned. If I give a gift, I'll say to someone, okay, I'm going to give you a gift, and this is what I want to return. It ceases to be a gift, right? Because now there's strings attached to it. So that's why the gift has to be freely given and voluntarily given. What if I can't pay back the gift? What if it is too great a gift that there's nothing I could ever do that would be as good or as great as the gift I have received? It seems to me that would be a little bit uncomfortable psychologically, emotionally for people. Could the gift actually become a burden as opposed to a blessing? And this is what Cronman says in his book, which if you haven't read any of it, uh, I don't necessarily recommend you reading it cover to cover because it's like 1,100 pages. So, so here it is, you know, pretty substantial. You see, I got through about the first, you know, couple of chapters. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what he says is that Christ he says that he argues that Christianity is the religion of unrequited gratitude because Christians, he says, can never make an appropriate return for the good they have received. From God, so we're overwhelmed by this need to give back. The gratitude owed to God is overwhelmed. There's no way we could ever reciprocate all of the goodness, all of the the good things uh, that we've received in life. We're never able to thank God adequately for His gifts. This indebtedness, He says, is unbearable. The uh, the unbearable indebtedness of being, I guess you would call that. Okay, He says, even you know, you say, well, what about you know, loving others or loving God? Isn't that a good way to give back? said, so, no, even that's not a sufficient return since God first loved us. Therefore, the love we feel is never ours to give in the first place. Also, we can never return a love that is as good or great as God's love. So all of this becomes a cause of envy and rebellion toward God and overall spiritual malaise, more generally. He believes that characterizes uh, modern time. Well, you may or disagree or agree with that. I don't know. It's, I think it's controversial. I, you know, is he right? Is he wrong? Um, I just think it's, again, it's, it's an example, and I, and I include this just to say that people are thinking about these issues in, in, in very sophisticated ways, ways in which you know, gratitude to God is different from person-to-person -person gratitude. Okay, uh, now I'm going to start to probably go a little bit more quickly because I want to be sure I say certain I've noticed there's a phenomenon, maybe you're familiar with it if you've been, been uh, any, had any kind of experience public speaking. As a speaker, the time goes really, really fast. As a listener, the time can go really, really slow. For me, it's going really, really fast. And so I'm going to probably skip a few things. I did mention yesterday that we talk about gratitude as a trait. We've developed the GQ questionnaire. If you're interested, you know, I can send that to you. You can look it up online. It's, it's uh, widely available. 
You can take it, find out if you're a grateful person or not. You can use it in clinical work. You can use it in research. Um, it's a quick six question uh, questionnaire. Works really, really well. And it gets at, I think, in some sense, uh, an aspect of the grateful virtue, the, the virtue of gratitude, which uh, I believe Pam is going to talk more about. So, uh, so that makes my job a little bit easier. I can skip over some of this. Um, I, I just want to, uh, again, um, give a shout out to another person in the Gratitude to God project. This is Tony Manella, who I think thinks more deeply about gratitude than anybody I've ever come across that I've read or that I know. He's a philosopher at Siena College, and he's written many, many articles and chapters on gratitude as a virtue. And more recently, he's taken up uh, the question of how does gratitude to God differ from gratitude to people? It's basically what gratitude is. It's a collection of, of there's cognitive elements, there's emotional elements, and there's behavioral elements to gratitude. Uh, there's a, uh, and they're all interrelated. There's a package, which, you know, combined constitutes a disposition, which is known as the grateful virtue, the disposition to form and sustain a properly grateful response to the right people at the right time and to the right degree. Okay, so it's not, it's not merely a thought. It's more than a feeling. Uh, it's not just a behavior of saying thank you, but it's an interrelated package or cluster of different elements. Okay? Now, why this is useful is because it can also help unpack the nature of ingratitude. You know, sometimes we learn about what something is by understanding what it is not or the opposite of it. And so uh, Tony, in one of his articles, you could just Google Google this if you're interested. Just, just put in his name, Tony Manella, and you can get uh, the text uh, versions of different uh, papers or chapters he's written. He has one on the varieties of uh, gratitude. It's called The Virtue of Gratitude and Its Associated Vices, where he really unpacks and, 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 and um, articulates the ways in which we can fail to be grateful. Okay? And what he says, there's, there's three basic ways we can fail to be grateful, given that gratitude involves the right kind of thoughts, the right kind of feelings. So thoughts about the, the giver and the gift, feelings toward the giver, and then behaviors toward the giver. So he's saying ways we could be ungrateful okay, are failures of attunement, where we're just insensitive to the nature of the gift or the giver, what he calls failures of establishment, right, when it, it comes to uh, becoming a uh, thinking about how we can repay the benefactor or give back the goodness that we received, as well as failures of duration that have to do with time, how long we are grateful for it. Let me show you in, in a chart, which I think I, I try to depict things graphically, represent them this way. It's a little bit uh, easier to uh, understand, I think. So he says, we start here at the top of the pyramid, gratitude as a virtue, right? It's this uh, predisposition this interrelated uh, sequence of elements, the right kind and degree of gratitude in all situations which it is called for, cognitive, affective, and behavioral. And then we can be insensitive to the goodness. We, we could just not recognize it or not be attuned to it. We may not be grateful for a long enough period of time. You know, so if someone does a favor today and we forget all about it, you know, tomorrow, that's not good. Or if we act on it too quickly, uh, let's say, you know, somebody has us over for dinner or takes us out to dinner. And at the end of the night, we pull out our checkbook and we say, how much do we, do we owe you, right? That's not being a very gracious receiver. Or we, or we invite that person to our home the next night. No, you want a little delay there, right? You need to be grateful for a long enough period of time uh, before it's appropriate to, uh, to reciprocate. And so, and then failure of establishment, each of these has both over and under. So you can have too much gratitude or too little gratitude. You can have a deficiency or an excess. We could be overly grateful. Uh, somebody brought up the question yesterday, can you have too much gratitude? I think so. You could be overly grateful where you magnify the gift. You know, if somebody holds the door open for me today and I spend the rest of the day profusely thanking them, you know, I'm running around opening the door for other people. And that seems a little out of proportion, uh, you know, or if, if somebody, you know, uh, saves my life, you know, uh, I, you know, they push me out of the way of an oncoming vehicle, you know, and at some point, you know, I send them a little thank you card or you know, whatever. It doesn't seem quite enough. So I can have an, an, an under, uh, you know, I can have a deficiency or excess of gratitude. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that if you're interested in probing deeper into the nature of the variety of ways to be ungrateful, uh, he is a very good source to go to. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about spiritual practices, okay? For us to grow our gratitude, to develop our gratitude more deeply and more sustainably, I think we have to practice this uh, intentionally and consistently over time. We know that religions do practice very well. They do litanies very well, litanies of remembrance, litanies of practice. There's individual, there's corporate practices. As Dr. Young mentioned yesterday in his re reply, there's you know things we do in groups, there's things we do together uh, uh, when we worship, but there's also private reflective exercise that we can engage in as well. When I teach psychology religion, or when I used to, uh, since now I don't teach undergraduates anymore, I've used this book by Christian Smith. And one of the great things, it's a very comprehensive book. It's very high level, it challenges uh, our students. Uh, there's a table where he lists the variety of religious practices. And you can see, teeny tiny print, you can't read them probably. There's like a hundred religious practices that he identifies as being you know, part of at least one major religious tradition. Some of these have to do with gratitude, and thanksgiving and developing deeper levels of gratefulness. And I've been trying to explore some of these in my works, such as journaling, which you know is a spiritual discipline, practice, exercise, whatever you wanna call it, ways of doing spirituality, which strengthens the capacity to you know, experience these states and all the benefits thereof. Uh, letters, you can write a letter to someone that you're grateful to and share that. I mentioned this yesterday and just expressing that gratitude, gratitude, and thanksgiving are outward expressions of an inward attitude. So we need the, both the private as well as the public aspects of gratitude, I think, in order to, for it to be most uh, fully recognized and fully um, realized in a person's life. So I wanna read to you a list of names, and I want you to tell me what they all have in common, okay? Some of these names should be familiar, others less so. Carl Bart, Cutter Calloway, Diana Bass Butler, Stanley Hauerwas, Peter Lightheart, Anne Voskamp, Robert Roberts, Elizabeth Hall, Paul Ricoeur, Julian of Norwich, Albert Schweitzer, Martin Heidegger, and Nicholas Wolterstorff. That's a dozen names. Actually, it's a baker's dozen. Uh, it's 13 names. So what they all have in common I believe, is the notion that identity, identity is the receptacle of gratitude. Say that again, identity is the receptacle of gratitude. Gratitude is not so much what we do, uh, what we feel, how we behave, or even what we think. Rather, it, it's who we are. Okay? Gratitude is who we are. Okay, uh, Walter Storff, let me give you just a couple of examples, right? Walter Storff said, to be human is to be that point in the cosmos where God's goodness is meant to find its answer in gratitude, okay? How about Karl Barth? Gratitude is the very being and essence of this creature. He's talking about man, humans, uh, being creatures, right, of the creator. Gratitude is the very being and essence of this creature. He says, Human being is gratitude. Okay? The life of gratitude must be understood radically. It's not a quality. It's not an activity. It's not just a change. And he says a change of temper or sentiment or conduct or action. Gratitude is the very being and essence of this creature. Human being is gratitude rather than being merely grateful. Elizabeth Hall, uh, my colleague at Biola, some of you know Liz, she writes, to be human is to be that place in creation where God's goodness find it, finds its answer in gratitude. When we see life as full of gifts and we are a receiver, our entire life is one big gift, enables us to organize our experience. So I, I believe this is true. I, I believe that it's part and parcel of who we are, seeing ourselves as receivers uh, of gifts and a potential giver of gifts onto other people constitutes our identity, the growth of identity, okay? Uh, making us aware of our past, who's helped us, who's contributed to who we are today. Uh, as we get older, we increasingly value gratefulness. In fact, one of the items on our GQ questionnaire is that as I get older, I can more better appreciate the people and circumstances and relationships and events that have transpired that have contributed to who I am 
today. People sustain us and, and uh, events define us and in culture influences us and shapes us and all shapes our identity. One more, Peter Lightheart said that gratitude is the truth of our existence. Our lives are given to us and our default state is gratitude. Gratitude, the place where we find our truest and best selves. I mean, isn't that amazing? There, there's an, a consolidation. Now, obviously, I haven't developed this as a you know, fully thought out you know, theory of gratitude, uh, but it, it just strikes me that so many people and from so many different perspectives and backgrounds and worldviews have said more or less the same thing about the nature and um, aspects of gratitude. It's just connected with, with who we are as individuals. So I am, who am I? I'm gratitude. I'm a grateful person. It's not just something I feel or do or perform or think about. It really constitutes my identity. Uh, I recently received this book in the mail. Uh, one of your colleagues at Fuller, I don't know if Cutter is with us uh, today, but I love this book, uh, Theology for Psychology and Counseling. I think it was just published, right? And he says in the book, how, again, how gratitude shapes identity, how being a receiver of gifts, a recipient of grace shapes who we are. The Spirit perpetually calls, invites, and even persuades us to locate the center of our personal identity not within ourselves, but outside ourselves, to receive it as a gift from God. I think for us to go in gratitude, we grow sometimes the wrong way. We think about gratitude as something we need to do and to get better at. It, it becomes a, um, uh, a self-directed project. You know, it's like, I want to become more grateful. I need to focus on my gratitude growth or lack thereof. So I get so self-absorbed with my own level of gratitude it takes the focus and puts the focus in the wrong place. Instead of being focused on what other people are doing for me or what God has done for me, I start to think about, no, how I need to become more grateful. And I, you know, I start to think, well, am I more grateful than other people? Am I more grateful than I was yesterday? You know, I want to be a 10 on your questionnaire and I'm only a seven. How do I move to a 10? And this actually gets in the way. By focusing on my graduate performance actually gets in the way of my ability to be grateful. And uh, I've done a few studies like that where I found that when people are actually absorbing themselves in a task to become more like using gratitude app on their phone, it actually works against their becoming grateful. But when they're asked to write a letter or make a visit to someone or to write about how this person has helped shape who they are, they actually become more grateful. It deepens the level of gratitude. So the practice matters, how we, how we uh, focus matters, whether you focus on ourselves or focus on others. Gratitude involves you know, focusing on the good others have done for us as opposed to being absorbed with our own particular spiritual growth. Maybe that's the case for most spiritual exercises. I don't know. I'm not the practical theologian here, but I think the science that I've done that I'm familiar with certainly does seem to bear that out. So let me end. It is right at 11 o'clock with a quote from the German theologian Gerhard Forde who said that Christianity is not the move from vice to virtue, but rather the move from virtue to grace, right? So growth in gratitude. Is it the movement from ingratitude to gratitude? I, I think he would say not. It's more the move from trying to be grateful to trying to be a, just being a receiver, focusing not on what you need to do. I need to keep a gratitude journal. I need to read this gratitude book, attend that gratitude seminar, and all those things, which can be useful, of course. But what he's saying is that, no, it's, it's seeing oneself as a receiver, focusing on what has been done as opposed mm. to what you need to do. I think ultimately, this is the way to deepen and sustain one's level of gratitude over time. So, so that's my story. Mm.